Christ, then we pray. Amen. Bibles are hand. Please turn to Matthew 22. We'll be there in just a moment. Matthew 22. Uh, this is a one-off. I've been preaching a lot of sermon series. This is a one-off, James. This is standalone. Uh, the greatest misconceptions of the Christian. This could be a series, but I'll look at a couple tonight. The greatest misconceptions we Christians have. Many Christians hold... Um, non-biblical concepts of God and the afterlife and uh, many doctrines are affected by non-Christian teachings. So tonight I'm going to look at a couple of misconceptions um, and see what scripture has to say. So the first one is this. Number one, God's will for my life is mysterious. God's will for my life is mysterious. How many folks have come to you over the years and especially young and not knowing what to do in life do i take this job or not do i join the army or not do i marry this girl or not what do i do in life what's god's will for my life what is his mysterious plan and i want to make sure i follow every step to be happiest as i can in his will well i want to show you god's will for your life and it's not as mysterious as you might think so the bible says matthew 22 37 and following jesus says this Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The quest for every Christian is to love God above everything, and secondarily to love your fellow man as much as, much as you love yourself. And if you do those two things, you're always in God's perfect will. Now, none of us do those perfectly. But as long as we strive to do that, whatever we do in life, whatever decision we make, if it's to glorify God in service, whatever capacity it is, and to uh, show love to fellow men, if you're doing those two things, wherever you go in life, you'll be pleasing God, you'll be doing His will. Whatever decision you make, whether you, whether you go into the military or whether you don't, whether you work in a slaughterhouse or drive a bread truck, Right? It doesn't matter where you go in life as long as you're, you seek, number one, to love and please God, and the number two, love your fellow man. You do those two things, then you can't go wrong. Makes sense, doesn't it? Brother Jared, should I, should I marry this lady? Well, the Bible doesn't say specifically who you ought to marry, but there's some criteria as to who you should look for in a marriage partner. Should I go off to this university or should I get this job? Well, the Bible doesn't tell you either one of those things, but as long as you're doing these two things here, loving God, loving man, you won't get off the road too far. Does that make some sense? You know, a hiker, when he wants to get out of the woods or to navigate, he tries to find true north, right? That's one of the things they teach in survival school. And there's lots of ways, if you're out in the woods somewhere, to find true north. Uh, you, you look for road signs, right? <laughs> Maybe. Or if you find polar bears, you've gone the right direction, right? <laughs> But if you're in the woods, there's some ways you can do this. If it's daylight, you look at the trees. Moss tends to grow on the north side of the trees. Find the pattern where moss is growing. If it's nighttime, find the north star. That typically, that's always going to be in the northern hemisphere in point of due north. In the middle of the ocean, you find the north star where there's no trees. You can navigate east, west, and south by finding the north star of the sky. Uh, if you maybe you're out and you can make a makeshift sundial. If you can find north, you can make a sundial and it tells you where south, east, and west, or those kinds of things. There's lots of little tricks you can do if you're lost in the woods to find your way out, but one of the they always say is find true north. When it comes to navigating through your life, the true believer must orient himself or herself to the position of God and walk accordingly. True north. Is God's will for your life mysterious? Well, the Bible is very clear on moral decisions. If you're a Christian, I'll put this on the screen, the Bible is very clear on moral decisions. You should not be questioning what is a moral decision if you're a Christian. You have the Bible as your roadmap, your moral guide, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. So the moral decisions ought to be fairly clear. But how about those non-moral decisions of your life? How about those decisions? Uh, for example, when you're in a shopping mall, do you look for a certain parking spot, right? Is God going to direct you to the right spot? Or if it's lunchtime, you're driving around town, do you go to Burger King or McDonald's? Uh, the answer is neither. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> or at the grocery store, the person used to say paper or plastic, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a non-moral decision. It doesn't matter whether it's paper or plastic. You choose what is, makes the most sense. Or do you take this job and, or do you wait for promotion at this job? Whatever the case would be. Well, those are non-moral decisions, aren't they? Those are decisions you can make that are, have no moral component to them whatsoever. What's God's will in those kind of things? 
Now, if I were a cult leader, and I'm not, I'd make those decisions for you. I'd tell you what to dress, what kind of perfume to spray on your bodies. I'd tell you how much to give to the church. I would tell you where to park your cars. I would tell you uh, how much you should give to me, right? If I were a cult leader, I'd make your job very easy. I would tell you what to do. And some folks like the security, like the safety of that, right? Cults get started all the time because people are looking for someone to tell them everything in life. And they would say, well, God's told me you got to do this. Well, in these non-moral decisions, I will not tell you how to live your life. I am no one's mother. And you ought to be thankful for that. God's given you a nice little uh, organ between your ears, your brain, that helps you reason these things out. Now, if I wanted to control your life, it'd be very easy. I could just tell you. And there's preachers in the community that will tell their congregations uh, about what to, what kind of clothes they should wear, what kind of hairstyles they should wear, and if not, if or if not, they should have jewelry in their ears. Uh, they'll tell their congregants those kinds of things. And the Bible nowhere addresses those things, right? Those are decisions you make based upon your own conscience. Those are decisions that you'll make as a Christian, as the Bible leads you. But I'm not a control freak. I'm not. I can't control myself. Well, I don't want to control you guys. Um, so when it comes to non-moral decisions, we make hundreds of decisions every day that aren't moral decisions. Like, do I stop at this gas station or the next? When I go in this gas station, after I've purchased my gas, do I get Twinkies or powdered donuts? Well, those aren't moral decisions, right? You just make those decisions all the time. So you don't have to ask God, Twinkies or, or cupcakes, uh, this much gas or this much gas. You just make the decision that makes the most sense. Does that make some sense to you guys? On non-moral decisions, you perfectly have a lot of freedom to make a lot of decisions in your life that have no moral ramifications whatsoever. But if you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, your neighbor, your neighbor as much as you love yourself, then the moral decisions and those other decisions kind of fall into place. Matthew 6, 28 and following. Jesus, this is his great sermon on the mount. This begins his public ministry, uh, preaching the mass as early on. Jesus says these words. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not, one of, not, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow stone to the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But, here it is, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What's Christ saying? Seek after God, everything else is secondary. The big stuff is, are you loving God? Everything else is secondary in life, isn't it? The big stuff, settle these matters, make peace with God, and everything else falls into place. Strive to serve Him wherever you are. Uh, by the way, we have this false conception, and this is my little soapbox for the next 30 seconds. Indulge me. Uh, we think that God has two occupations of service, secular service and sacred service. The guy that pumps your gas, he ha he's a secular job. He serves God in a secular capacity. And the and the guy in the pulpit has a sacred job and he serves God in a sacred capacity. That's nonsense. All jobs, all Christians are employed by God foremost. Every job has a, has a sacred component to it. Whether you're the butcher who cuts the meat at the grocery store or the barber that cuts your hair down the street, your job has a sacred capacity because you're called of God to do those jobs, to share the gospel wherever you are. Does that make some sense? Don't create this false dichotomy. Well, this guy's doing this job, so he must be more righteous, or God demands more of this person uh, in, in certain ways. If you're a Christian, your job is the same as mine outside of these doors to share Christ to a lost and dying world. So many folks say, wow, especially, especially younger adults who are just entering the adulthood, they'll say, man, I don't know what to do in life. Uh, life is so complicated, and it is complicated, but God must have a mysterious plan, a roadmap. i got to tap into this and figure this sort of thing out. Nope. No. Love God with all your heart. Jesus said, seek first kingdom of God, and everything else will be added unto that. You'll, it'll, you'll figure out a way to feed yourself. You'll figure out a way to clothe yourself. That's all secondary stuff. Follow God, and you're in his perfect will. Number two is this, and this is timely, especially in, the, in American Christianity. God wants me to be always healthy and wealthy. John 16, 1 through, 11, uh, 1 through 4. Uh, Jesus says this, 
All, I've, I, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Now, I've told you this so that when the, their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. You know, one of the things Jesus promises in these verses first to the disciples and then, of course, to other Christians after them, is that they're going to face persecution. And if you don't think that's true, read the book of Acts. We see the church being persecuted first by the Jews, then later on by the Romans, eventually by the Romans, of course. Jesus said to the disciples, I didn't tell you at first when you first signed on to this, but now I'm about to leave and to die and go on. I want you to know that if you stick with, with, with the gospel, with preaching the good news, people are going to hate you for my sake. Um, if you don't believe me, when you get to heaven, ask Stephen if they persecuted Christians in the first century. That's the guy that was the very first martyr of the Christian faith was Stephen. Uh, James was killed uh, pretty early on by Herod. So all the events in the book of Acts happened to the apostles, didn't they? The people were killed for Christ's sake. But what you don't hear preached in the Gospels or anywhere in the New Testament is that God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. If you give to the church of Jerusalem, God's going to make your bank account overflowing and he's going to triple. The, it's an investment you make. You invest in the God, he's going to triple your money. Or if you're faithful to serve him, he's going to give you good health. In fact, what we see is the opposite of that oftentimes. The apostles left everything. That's wealth to serve Christ. The apostles were martyred and killed and tortured, right? They left health to serve Christ. They weren't given those things in this lifetime. Uh, our promise doesn't come in this life, but the life to come. Uh, let me look in... Uh, same chapter, a few verses later, verse 31 and following. Jesus says this, Do you now believe? A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. Now I've told you these things. It sounds like deja vu, doesn't it? I've told you all these things, so you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus predicts here that they're going to be scattered. And read the Gospels, if you would, and you find in all four Gospels that when Christ is arrested, the disciples get pretty thin, don't they? They scatter. The herd thins out pretty fast. In fact, when Christ is crucified, there's only one disciple at the foot of the cross, and that's John. Everyone else is gone. And, and John, John needs recognition for that fact. So anytime I get a chance, I want to really... Pat John on the shoulder, right? He stayed, stayed. But he stayed because he wasn't a threat. He stayed because he probably was only 17, 18 years old at the time. He posed no threat to anyone. And so nobody suspected him of starting, starting a revolution at eight, you know, 16, 17 years old. But the rest of the disciples, uh, to, their, to their discredit, are gone from Christ. He predicted that, didn't he? Is the Bible a roadmap for your financial success? Is it, does it give you six keys for being healthy, wealthy, and wise? It does not. In fact, Jesus says to the apostles and then to those Christians after, in this world you will have trouble. I firmly believe that for every pagan that gets cancer, a Christian gets cancer. So we can show pagans how to die. So we can show pagans how to live with cancer, that this does not have to destroy the Christian because our hope lies not in this life, but the life to come. I think that God gives uh, trouble and heartache, not allows it at least, not just to the pagan, but also the believer, so that we can model for the world how to live. Uh, years ago, was a friend of mine I worked with. He was, in, he was from San Antonio, but he moved up into this area. And the church where he's going, the pastor, and I'm not even sure if the pastor is there anymore, but he wrote this best-selling book. Uh, the pastor's name is, and I, I I regret not putting on the screen the title of the book, but it was a book by a guy named Steve Fender, which pastored a large church in San Antonio, Texas. And the title of the book was this, and I don't suggest you buy it because it's garbage, unless you just want kindling to start your next fire. If you have it, it's a good fire starter. But he gave me this book. To, he said, review this book and tell me what you think. Well, the book is entitled, Taking the Waver Out of Your Walk. Now, on the cover of the book, and you can tell... Listen, people say you can't judge a book by the cover. No, you can. That's why they have covers on books. So you can decide if you're going to buy it or not. And if you can't tell by the author, look at the flap because the flap will describe what the book is about. And I looked at the back of the book and it just gave us a synopsis of the book. And it said this to quote, This book claims to quote, shed light on the steps one can take to make certain the word of God is allowed to work in one's life. 
if you walk according to the principles in this book, then God will bless you with material possessions, end quote. And I said, I can review the book on the flap alone. That's not biblical. That, the Bible does not promise that if you come to church and put money in the offering plate or give to Steve Fender's church or buy his book or, or come to his ministry events, that God's going to bless you with material pros prosperity. It's not, that's not what happens. People say, well, how about uh, Kenneth Copeland? He claims to be a billionaire. Guys, he's top of the Ponzi scheme. He's there not because he's served God, but because Christians have been giving him money over the years. He's rich because they've been giving to him. And the promise in his ministry is you give to me, God will give it back. But those folks who gave him his ministry are as broke as they were in the beginning. It does not work. It's scientifically verifiable. You give to his ministry, all you've done is lost that money. And if you give your last $5 to Kenneth Copeland's ministry and you can't pay a light bill next month, that's God's judgment upon you. That's God judging your stupidity, right? That's, that's you hoping to invest money. Guys, when you give money to the offering plate at the church, this ain't an investment for your future financial success in this life. When you give money to the, the church, you're giving it to God's work in this kingdom. And you may not get, you may probably won't get back 10 times the investment. That's not what the offering of the church plate's for, is it? But this, this kind of books are written by mega, mega church pastors, and there's a dime a dozen of these folks that pastor large churches that write books like this because they're trying to promise pagan unbelievers, if you come here and do these six things, you'll be rich. And who doesn't want to be rich? Who doesn't want to be rich? If we made promises to this church and advertised it around town, come to church, we'll have a seminar next Sunday on how to double your wealth. You'd have them packed out next week, wouldn't you? Then I got I to lie to them because <laughs> we got them here. I think I, what Mark Twain said was best. The best way to double your money is take out your pocket and bend it in half. Stick it back in. That's the best way to double it. But it, the Bible nowhere promised. In fact, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, 1 Timothy. This is Paul's words to young Timothy who was um, serving faithfully in Ephesus. Paul says this. They're conceited and understand nothing. He's talking about false teachers. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malice, talk, evil suspicions, and constant fiction, friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But here's the key. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world... And we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. And those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and run into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Uh, Paul, speaking to Timothy, warns him of those folks who've come out of the church there in Ephesus that they've came and offered false teachings, uh, just like Steve Fender has in his book, to Waver from the Walk or whatever it was, promising po folks, this prosperity gospel is nothing new, but the promise has always been around, if you serve God or do this or that in churches, then God's going to bless you. But what does Paul say? He says, godliness with uh, contentment is great gain, right? If you're satisfied with what God's given you, then you've already succeeded in life. What Paul does not say is godliness is a means to financial gain. That's what some people have always been teaching. Uh, Paul told young Timothy to be content. Um, he never teaches Timothy to preach the prosperity gospel. He said, but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. How many folks have ever starved? Most of us never been hungry. But Isaac, I fast every day, the time period between breakfast and lunch. I go without eating, and then I do it again in the afternoon, <laughs> faithfully until I get home to eat dinner. But I'll be honest, I don't, I don't fast, and I've never felt real hunger. And most of us have been hungry, but we've never starved, never been on the verge of starvation. I know some of us have, Jerry, you've mentioned your childhood was kind of tough, and you may have gone with eating not the food you wanted growing up, but you're here. Right? And your your parents assured at least there was brown beans in the pot, right? And at least there, maybe not. <laughs> That's right. There was always something sooner or later. That's, and they did the best they could, probably, in the cir circumstances. Too, where I went a week or so without food, but yet never 
You never starved to death, or if you did, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Things got thin. But Paul said, if we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. And that, that's the key to life, isn't it? Um, he said, listen carefully, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and fall into many foolish and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and darkness, ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Those who seek after money may find it, but it's going to be their end, isn't it? Guys, the gospel is not some rich, get rich quick scheme. It's the redemption of men. God may let you go through difficult, God may lead you through difficult times to accomplish something great. I think the greatest example in the Bible that we see, aside from Christ, for this principle is that Joseph, who was in Egypt, he went through hardship. He was sold by his brothers of slavery. They showed him down to the Edomites. They took him down to slave traders in Egypt. They brought, they, 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 he was sold into Pharaoh's court. He was accused falsely. He was put in a dungeon in Egypt. And many years of serving in the dungeon, he was taken out. And through God's sovereign plan, was, was paid, made second in command of all of Egypt. And then years later, his brothers came into Egypt to get grain to buy grain. And they thought he was dead because they sold him. They thought he'd never see this little brother, this brat kid again. And he grows up and he's second in command of the whole free world, the Egyptian empire. They come to buy grain twice from him. And then he reveals, after, the, after Darrow dad dies, he reveals who he is, that he's Joseph. Uh, he, reveals, well, he reveals that he's Joseph. And then when they die, they're afraid, of course, he's going to, you know, off with their heads kind of thing. Genesis 50, 20, the end of the book of Genesis wraps up this way. This is some of the uh, greatest insights you get on suffering ever. Joseph says to his brothers who sold him to slavery, you intended to harm me, but God. He could have stopped right there. But he, he finishes, intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We look at the Old Testament scriptures, Christ is in, in the Old Testament type and shadow, and one of those figures is Joseph, is prefigured Christ, and Christ says the same things to those folks who nailed him on the cross. You meant this for evil. You meant this for evil. Shame on you. But God meant this for good to save many, many lives. God, amen. That's exactly right. He was seeking the kingdom of God, wasn't he? Faithfully serving in a dungeon he served him. Amen. Good, good, good insight there. Um, God took what was objectively bad, slavery, uh, being beaten, uh, falsely accused, imprisoned, all those things in Joseph's life for good. God used that evil, and nobody says that being beaten and sold to slavery is good. Everybody agrees that's bad, but God used what was bad for his good. The imprisonment, the torture, the betrayal, all were bad things, yet God used that for good. I think of Christ, God's own son. He uses the cross, the symbol of suffering, the worst torture you can imagine on earth to be tortured slowly to death. He uses that torture device to accomplish his greatest good, the salvation of men. What well, does God want me always healthy, wealthy, and wise? Not necessarily. Uh, God wants you to love him, worship him. He wants you to find fulfillment in him and him alone. That's the essence of the gospel, isn't it? Um, the primary pursuit of the church, our primary focus shouldn't be on uh, sports cars and private jets. And that'll be on finding and pursuing Christ. You got that? Let's close out in prayer. Father, we thank you this evening for letting us come into your presence and to worship you. Father, we admit that we fall far short of serving you with all of our heart and all of our minds and loving you with all of our strength. Father, we fall short of that, but Father, our, our goal is to love you above everything. Well, help us in this week to come to uh, best be found in your will by loving you above everything else and loving our neighbor as much as ourselves. Father, this plays itself out uh, it, wherever we work, wherever we live, wherever we go. Help us to uh, be in the center of, of your permissive will by serving you 